Hello everyone, and welcome to this Nintendo Life episode 96. My name is NBZ, and yes, once again, I sound slightly different. I'm away from home, my great microphone isn't with me, so I'm back to the good old headset. Hopefully it sounds okay and it bears up for the rest of the episode. But I'm joined by Bally, who is not uh, in some other part of the world, although he's going to be soon. Well, I am, but I've I've also moved. I've moved. Oh, right. I've moved across Brussels, and I hate moving. MBZ, like it's really difficult, and uh -huh. my back was aching, and oh, just so many bags. But I've got my new setup. I've got my Wii U, my Switch, my 3DS. They're all ready to go in the new apartment, and I've got more space now. It's a bit. It's a bit. It's a bit fresher. It's nicer. Got well, um, actual like living room now where you I've can got, put yeah. a big TV and have some uh, some good video game time. Exactly, so. uh, which is great. Um, but yeah, my back is not it's not happy about it. And yeah, I'm off to off to Mallorca this weekend, so that'll be nice. Great. Well, uh, you can take your Switch with you, which will be fun exactly. time, of course. Exactly. Um, uh, and get on with uh, some, some of that. But uh, we are going to get on with uh, some video game stuff before you go and head off and leave us so that the nice people at home can actually have a podcast to listen to. So it's why don't you lay out thing. the show for us? We've got what we've been playing for the first segment. For our second segment, we are going to go through a couple of your listener emails. And then for our third segment, we've got a bit of a news roundup. There's been... One really big story, and then one lesser big story, a little bit of a news roundup. Yeah, some uh, interesting things with the uh, Super Nintendo Classic and Splatoon 2 going on, uh, and uh, we'll dive into all of that at the end of the show. But we're going to kick things off, as per usual, with the things we've been playing the last couple of weeks, and Bally can finally say it. You beat have Zelda. beaten beat The Zelda. Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Well, round of I applause, have. everyone. Round of applause. There I, we go. I've beaten the final boss and i have 18 shrines to go so there's still there's still more of that game to play i've also just downloaded the dlc uh what what's it called the, the master trials yes um, that is correct so that's what i'm going to be playing the next little while uh especially while i'm away of this long weekend uh-huh uh but yeah I've, I've, I've done it i don't want to i don't I, I loved it don't worry but i don't want to share you know too many thoughts and feelings just yet because we are going to do a Zelda Breath of the Wild spoiler cast um, in the very near future, and I will definitely be unloading a ton of thoughts uh, when when we record that, and we'll I'll hopefully have beaten all the shrines by then as well, to, so I can just have a sort of like a a final opinion perhaps on that game. Is this the most hours you've played of a game slash the longest it's taken you to beat a game since we've started the podcast? Because I'm trying to think. You played Xenoblade Chronicles, which yeah. was a good 90 or so nothing, hours. Nothing comes close to Xenoblade or Breath of the Wild in my mind, I don't yeah. think. Um, Xenoblade, th you actually beat relatively quickly considering the length yeah. of the game. Um, I mean, I, but I, I got to the end of that game and I sunk probably. in a ton of hours trying to beat that final boss. Um which I don't want to even think about. It was just horrible. <laughs> but, uh -huh. um, after that, it's games like Fire Emblem, uh, stuff like Pokemon Red. Uh, there's honestly, maybe even like other Zelda games that Ocarina of Time I've spent a lot of time on, but and they're all sort of 20 to 30 hours. Uh, I believe f the longest I played a Fire Emblem was high 30s. I don't even think I got to 40. So yeah, Xenoblade was up to 90, and this I'm already at 105 to 110. So it's easily the most uh, the number one yeah. number one and oh, i have a lot to say on that game but i will i will hold back for now but yeah that's, yeah, for that's sure. what i've been i've been doing uh, spending a lot of time on. um i also played one two switch in a party environment twice not not just once so so we have some uh, social experimentation going exactly on so so my good friend um alex who, who occasionally listens to the show um and his girlfriend Shout out to Kate, alex caitlin uh, who I think she listens to the show occasionally as well. So shout out, well, shout out to around. both of you. <laughs> uh, they came around like our uh, weekend before last, uh, and we played some one two switch. We played uh, the uh, team battle, I believe it's called. We so split up into teams. I was with Caroline um, versus those two, and it worked really well. I think Alex had a really good time. Like it just was really fun, and like because with these. Even with like Wii Sports or even something like Nintendo Land, when you're when you're trying to give it to now Alex plays tons of video games, so he's a terrible example. Like he he can pick up and play whatever you want. He knows he knows what how to how to uh, slice the sausage when it comes to video games. But uh -huh. but when you're reaching out more, one two switch is it's always about teaching people how to play the game because 
Now, looking at this very foreign Joy-Con, I should say that the following week, anyway, I was at a party with seven of us, and we were in the living room having had some drinks with an HD TV, and it was like a, a better, even better setting for Switch One Two Switch. So, but I, it's very interesting to see people who aren't into video games pick up a Joy-Con and they look at it and they just like it, they're really it's actually really intimidating to them. They think, oh my god, this thing has millions of buttons coming out of it and it's so tiny and you know i don't actually think it's as easy to pick up it's more intimidating than the wiimote i, w- I would say uh, sure there's, there's more kind of clustered in it than the wii remote had because mm. the wii remote was very basic because i think that the thing that emblem uh, em- is emblematic of the simplicity of the wiimote is the big a button in the center right like that kind of sticks out as like this is kind of your main input um, exactly so, so one two switch like what it has going for it and unlike Wii Sports or something like a Nintendo Land is that they have these obviously the videos that describe how to play the game and like these videos are genuinely hilarious the actors are great uh, and very over the top really over the top and it gets because everyone's everyone no one wants to feel silly you know even after a few drinks there's some people who just don't want to feel silly and you have to really kind of jump into it and feel silly to do well in this game and the actors and the videos really make the environment feel more silly and more right. over the top. It, 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 if any, because everyone goes, oh, no, I don't want to play video games, especially not competitive video games. I don't want to take it seriously. And like, sure, these games and like the videos just make it take all the seriousness out of it. Ideally, like there were still some people who were just really skeptical. They were like, I am not happy. Like, uh-huh. and it, it, what was really funny is we'd been playing board games all day. And then there'd be a few people where we'd move from board games at the at the dining table ra- round to um round to the living room to play one two switch, and it was a bit like, uh, like I'm happy playing board games, but they just could not comprehend the idea that they were going to be playing video games. It was like a big thing, and and they'd always use the line like you know, oh I'm not a gamer, oh I'm not. It's like right one two switch is not designed for gamers like it's no. if anything it just pisses off gamers. And the thing about one two switch is it's probably the least video of video games out there like it's an audio game almost. It, yeah it's it's less of a video game than we sports exactly it's so i was i was quite shocked at how hard it was to convince certain others that this was a fun thing to do uh, and there were other skeptical people who were far more receptive to it so they, the second they saw these videos they were they were like oh that's cool i, I want to try this and it's cool because you have team battle the mini game is randomly picked and then you get a brief description of the game and then within your team you can decide who you want to play that game so someone might be like oh i, d- I don't want to I don't want to dance about that's ridiculous but someone else might be absolutely dying to dance you might have had a couple more drinks than someone else and they're just just ready to go whereas someone who's had too many drinks might not be the one who wants to do the sort of the safe unlock which requires a lot more concentration and and a steady hand perhaps so there's a, a nice mix of games that appeal to different people and it worked really well I I I think that I don't know people weren't prepared and I was definitely the only one who I, I think most people in that room had definitely played something like a Wii Sports before but that was obviously a very long time ago people were like sure. I'm not sure what this is I've not heard like, most people who tried Wii Sports the first time had already heard positive feedback from others that Wii Sports was a fun thing and something they should that was fun to try Right. No one in the room had obviously heard of One Two Switch. Like we're talking about Europe here, you know. Like had, it's had people not... heard of the Switch as a system, though. Hardly. Like people okay. were like, "What is this? Is it a Nintendo GameCube? Is it an N sixty four? You know, the okay. usual. Like, it's just a Super Nintendo." Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, nope, it's a Switch. I, I was but... going to say, if they had heard of the Switch, I don't think Nintendo have done a good job of marketing One Two Switch as the big kind of title with it. and it yeah. isn't the big title right because the switch has been sold off the back of an enormous you know 3d zelda that's yeah. the thing most people is... most people were like because i'd load up the game and everyone could see like other games that i played and obviously zelda breath of the wild was right there and people were like oh you've got zelda and then someone was like didn't zelda come out like 20 years ago it's like um <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah there are a lot of those zelda but... games so like and i just have to like bite my lip and say don't worry we're gonna be playing one two switch i don't want to get into a debate about when zelda started yeah. so, but it, we muddled on by i think the majority of people in the room had a really good time from one two switch and like i would get it out again um and definitely cool. following an, envi- an environment where 
uh, it's quiet there wasn't it wasn't loads of music going on in the background it was like a big part it was just seven of us having had having had played board games it was just a nice thing to transition into um, cool. and worked really well I, I think i would have struggled had the, it not been for the hdtv so obviously the audio of the switch itself. right because i was asking you about like the volume stuff because i thought you just brought the switch on its own and not right. the dock but you kind of went whole hog with yeah it, i went so. but that's the thing about a switch which is great going whole hog requires literally just the dock and a scart cable not a scart cable an hdmi cable like it's literally two more cables right and and you know the person who you're going to probably has an hdmi cable there anyway so well it was a that, house that we rented and i always bring mine just in case but um, all right exactly it's not it's easy to do so it, yeah. it it worked well and i'd highly recommend it um yeah i'll i'm always willing to get out one two switch again so that was quite a, quite a fun experience but yeah um I've also been playing uh, a game that you lent me, MBZ, uh, which came out in yeah. 2015, which of course is uh, Kirby and the Rainbow Paintbrush. <laughs> that is its name. Well, that, this might be the first time in the history that, of this that podcast is, that, is, that, is, that you have said the name and not had to ask me about it and got it right. See, I thought Crazy. you were going to storm in, storm in and say, Bally, that's the European name. You want to say that the American name, which of course is like Rainbow Curse. Um, sure. So, Everyone knows the game I'm talking about. It came out 2015. Um, the follow-up to uh, the DS uh, beloved classic Kirby, Canvas, Canvas Curse, Curse or the Magic um, Paintbrush, as it was yeah. called. In, uh, Again, Europe. European names uh, yeah. being bad. Confirmed. Europeans can't have curses, apparently. So no. who knows? <laughs> um, it, this game was great. It only took me about four and a half hours, and it's very short. And it's a massive flaw of the game how short it is. Uh, but there's something about this game that you just think it's kind of the last of an era it's like the last of an era of touch screen uh stylus based games you could almost argue like it, it yeah it feels like one of if not the last i mean you could potentially obviously can't when did mario maker come out it's the same year wasn't it but I it mean, was the end of that year yeah. right so maybe mario maker is a better example of the the last but th- that idea of level based gameplay using a stylus uh wasn't very common on the wii u at all really uh and it was obviously so huge on the ds with games like canvas right. curse yoshi it's funny you're saying this because i feel like canvas curse heralded the beginning of that era the beginning and now this I... is heralding the end uh, no that's a really so... good point actually you're right canvas curse was one of the first good experiences perhaps you could describe yeah as. i don't know, you know that... we had things like yoshi's touch and go touch which and was go. much more of a mini game right than anything um else, but... but this game it just it does some really great things. I was initially shocked at not just the art style, which was obviously from the second this game was ever shown off E uh, E3, everyone was like, oh my God, the art style is lovely. And I absolutely love it. And yes, it's a huge shame that you can't, you're looking at a non-HD gamepad when the game yeah. looks so lovely in HD in front of you. And that's a shame. But I, although I don't really know how they could have got around that much better, but I just think like the music in this game is was really quite surprising like Kirby games generally are a bit the music is almost by the numbers it's like plinky plonks Kirby's got his classic songs and yeah it, they're fine but this game just really seems to step it up in a way that I've not seen a Kirby do before Kirby game do before like it really great remixes of the, the Kirby classics uh really immersive music I, really good sound design like, I just really liked that aspect of this game and that's not something I normally think I don't recall think... that being something that stood out to me but yeah, you know, maybe I, I wasn't really you know playing with the volume on too high or maybe anything. I was um, maybe I, I was already more susceptible as a result of the incredible art style because it's definitely sure the you best... kind of want to just throw yourself yeah, in the, there I the guess the best thing going for this game um, mechanically it does feel quite a lot slower than something like Canvas Curse um, it feels a bit easier as well i would argue um it, it's neither some great bosses in there one downside again is like the bosses repeat themselves which is like criminal in yeah. a game that has seven worlds they do like, change them like slightly with they uh, do. the underwater versions and stuff like that I think. true so like um, the bosses change ever so slightly but i mean you can say the same about mario galaxy like the boss right are it's repeated, the ead but problem they have, of, yeah uh, exactly but they have minor changes um sure. there's some really cool things the game does to mix up levels like you're playing as a submarine a rocket a tank the submarine was really cool because you basically tap anywhere on the screen and kirby will move there and you think well this is a bit boring and easy like what's what's the what's the cool thing about the submarine the submarine automatically shoots rockets 
and then the rockets follow the lines that you draw them so like you're you're like cupping rockets around corners and up and down the level to like right so instead of moving kirby on the lines you're moving yeah and like it's really cool i think the the submarine might be my favorite transformation in the game um i I recall the tank one being kind of fun as well tank one was very good too basically tank tap kirby moves automatically along the bottom a bit like it's a bit feels very much like touch and go actually like it's right you, you yeah. point here and it and it shoots um shoots ammo uh the, the rocket was a bit weaker i found and it's a shame because they make a i feel like the rocket comes up more than the other transformations um and uh-huh. there's like even a couple of ex- escape sequences and things in this game it's very strange like you're drawing paths throughout through like a a maze to escape a level essentially uh but it, it does some cool things rockets just it can sometimes get a bit trapped and it starts rebounding off little narrow areas and it can be a bit difficult to clearly draw a, a, a route out using the stylus so that's one weakness but overall i like the fact that these tran- transformations are in there and it really does mix up the game um and you've got your classic canvas curse stuff where you're sort of drawing sweeping lines to block off rockets and lasers and doing different things with enemies that are like are more unique so like it, it feels really good and there, there's a whole separate challenge mode that i didn't dabble with at all that i i really got into with the canvas curse uh, game but that's something that like this i've not been back to but it's something i might consider going back to with a game like this like it's just a nice way to make such a short story mode make a game feel a bit a bit more fleshed out yeah for sure i uh <clears throat> i remember uh dan Riker of giant bomb getting somewhat frustrated with elements of this game like some of the boss battles where there'd be very tight kind of corners that you would get stuck in and you would get hit very often did you find any of that frustration in the control department when you were going uh through? No, I I thought that the bosses generally move very very slowly, and they they really um, they don't give away. They, they're very obvious about the moves they're about to make. There's no right. hiding it. This looks like oh, the squid is charging up its head, and it's about to charge across the screen in this angle, and you've got five seconds to get to a center. Yeah. Like it, <laughs> it takes ages to build up, and for that reason, I think that the the bosses work really well. Okay. Uh, the game's not too fast at any point really it's saying right we appreciate you're not directly controlling kirby therefore we'll give you a bit more time to get into the right place to right, charge him yeah. up to do what you need to do and i think the game mechanically works well in that that aspect so i wouldn't i wouldn't agree with dan Riker in that sense um i just think that it's it's really nice that they brought this formula back seeing cam- seeing as canvas curse was like what 2000 and seven eight no uh, five or five four, like, yeah, like, earlier than that, yeah really long time ago so it's like a 10 year break between the two games um and i'm glad they brought it back it's a really nice addition to the wii u library like one day when we look back at what did the wii u have to offer i think this will history will do good for this game like people will think oh yeah. yeah i remember when you controlled kirby with a stylus like that was great like and then they brought it back and the cute art style and yeah i think it, this game will age well and i'm glad it came out i'm glad you picked up mz and i'm glad I, I borrowed it off you i think you paid what 20 quid for this game yeah which i think is the right price i think that's pay. a really fair price because you yes, should probably it is pay short. a little less maybe but i Perhaps. i just thought you know it, Def- the one problem with this was it was during an era of Wii U where they didn't have enough retail software and they took games that probably should have been download only titles and made them full products um so right yeah but yeah it's cool i'm i i'm definitely going to mention this in my sort of top games of the year at the end of the year so wait until cool. then for it to be watched again but mbz what have you been dabbling with this this week uh, so I finally, you know, we're talking about you spending forever on a game. I spent longer on a game <laughs> than you did, although time wise, more than one hundred and ten hours. No, no, no. Time wise, okay. I didn't. Um, it only took me around forty-five hours total. Uh, but in terms of like when I started it to when I finished right. it, I started Dragon Quest Eight in January when it came out, uh, and then now in the, the end of June, July, uh, I finally finished it. So I finished Dragon Quest Eight. Um, 
I was around 20 hours or so in when I picked it back up in the course of three days. I kind of just burned the fuck through it and was like, I just need to get this off my plate. Like, I just need to be done with Dragon Quest VIII. Um, and it's a weird feeling because this is a game that is heralded by most fans and a lot of people as one of the best in the series. Like, it's held up as like, okay, Dragon Quest VIII, one of the best ones they've released. Like, five and eight are usually heralded as like, yeah, these are the, the top of uh, the crop, the uh, the cream out there. And I just wasn't feeling it in the same way as, as people had been talking about it. Like, I think a lot of the problem was it felt very punishing when it came to the number of enemies that would uh, you would come across when you were fighting them on the map and the amount of damage they would do and the kind of the grind that was present felt kind of a mountain that was really hard to climb because mm. the amount of experience you gain from that's how I always feel with these games enemies. MZ <laughs> oh yeah but I think Dragon Quest generally okay so here's the thing Dragon Quest is a game that uh, a lot of people have talked about being very popular in Japan because you know, people like, you know, uh, housewives at home and people who just have a lot of time on their hands, uh, you know, they can beat this game if they put enough time into it, essentially, because it's all about grinding. It's no matter what, like, your skill level is, if you're a high enough level, you can probably finish it, right? Mm. And that's true, because that ended up happening for me. But the problem is... The, the journey to get there is so fucking ridiculous <laughs> that I I feel like it, it wastes a lot of your time, right? Mm. Um, and and so, like, I appreciate that grinding is an important part of these games, but sometimes they take it too fucking far. And this is a game where I think they take it way too fucking far. Um, so, so that idea kind of persisted through the game, and I was enjoying the story. I actually think that the the voice acting is fantastic, and the characters are really interesting. They, I wish they did a bit more with them because they're a kind of when you first meet these characters, you get a good sense of who they are and their motivation behind why they want to join you on your quest, and kind of their back history. You get some kind of flashback scenes. But then after that, they don't really return to these characters. Like, the story kind of blows up a bit more, and it's more about, you know, gotta save the world and all this stuff. So it's not much... I like that deeper focus on characters, and I think one of the reasons I love the original Xenoblade so much is because it has that scale of saving the world, but it never forgets where it comes from. You know, like, there are always moments that dig back into those characters and mm. why they're there and their deeper motivations. Um, and Dragon Quest, I think, could do better if it had kind of peppered some of that stuff in a bit more ultimately the dragon quest games have never been super serious and have never like had anything other than a kind of very cartoony uh very vibrant kind of happy plot but that said you know i, I just wish they would have dug a bit more into it right uh but what happened was i got to a point where i found this area full of metal slimes and metal slimes in the dragon quest series bally are basically enemies that have very low amount of health they're quite hard to hit but if you beat them, you get a fuck ton of experience, right? So at this point in the game, I was kind of like under leveled and I had been struggling somewhat. And I was like, right, I'm just going to sit down here for a couple of hours and just grind the hell out of these metal slimes. And the nice thing about this remake is unlike the original, there's no random battles, right? So it's not like Pokemon where you're running in the grass trying to find things you see all the enemies on the map so you can run into them you can avoid them it makes it a much smoother experience and added to that when you go into battle there's an option to speed up the battles which i left on for the entire game because why wouldn't you want to just speed past these animations that take fucking forever mm. so a, a game which should be 80 hours on the ps2 turned out to be around 40 45 hours for me which i think those elements are very important because number one if you're trying to grind metal slimes in the original Dragon Quest, it's random battles, so you can't target them, right? Whereas here, I can see when a metal slime pops up, and I can just keep spinning the camera around to reload enemies on the map, and I can just go and target it and be like, okay, I'm taking that one, and that one, and that one. So it made my grinding much more efficient, and the faster speed up battle made it so that I could just get through these battles faster. So I was just grinding and grinding, and I got to like uh, 10 levels higher than I needed to be. And then I just kind of skirted through the game. I was just like going from story point to story point. And it was really liberating because it feels like it wastes your time in terms of normal enemies. The normal enemies just don't give you enough experience. And if you're trying to grind on them, you're just going to get nowhere. You're, you're going to be there for literal tens and twenties of hours trying to get your experience up because every time you level up, it like the the bar gets much higher to get to the next level, right? Um, so it was just a nice experience to have 
be at a, a good level and to be able to just enjoy the story and not have to worry about random battles and going through and just avoiding everything. Um, so that was good and it helped the pacing, I think, because it meant I was going from place to place much more. I was picking up new stuff and finding new things and and that was where I was kind of enjoying the game a lot. Uh, until I got to the end and I thought I was the right level and the boss just fucking creamed me and it was just not even a... It was no, it's a JRPG, no come on. <laughs> I know, but like, god damn it, I really fucking hate the the practice of Japanese RPGs just ending with boss fights that are <laughs> fucking impossible and you need to go and grind again. And I was like, at this they point, I was so high level that the metal slimes weren't even doing it for me, so I was like, what the fuck do I do? So I went online and I had a look up, like, where are the best grinding spots? And there was this one area, which is this hill, which just has a bunch of different slimes on it, but it doesn't have just metal slimes, it has king metal slimes. And king metal slimes give you fucking 30,000 experience for every time you kill them, only they're a lot harder to kill. Uh, but I had one of these abilities on my characters, which was uh, a, a, an ability called Executioner. And it's kind of like a 50-50 chance whether it hits or not. But if it does hit, it basically does critical damage. So I was basically just running into all these metal slimes, trying to do that every time. Um, and hoping they don't run away from me, because another thing with them is that they flee as soon as fucking possible. Um, and every time you beat one, you get 30k experience. And like the first time I did that, like everyone leveled up instantly. I was like, okay, here we go. So... Uh, I took another like hour or so, a couple of hours, grinded up to level 50, so I was 10 levels higher than I was before, went into the boss and died again. I was like, what the fuck is this shit? <laughs> um, but, uh, but the second time, like I played it a little bit better and I was able to finish it. But um, in, in any case, uh, Dragon Quest VIII, I think, is a good game. I just, I really question why people hold it up so much in the Pantheon um of, of these of the, this series uh because as fun as the story is it is very simple um and the voice acting is great but i wish they went deeper on it um and the world is cool but again it, it, it's weird because it feels like this would have been much more impressive back in 2008 or whenever it was that it came out but yeah. in 2017 just like you know i've just played an open world game in breath of the wild which is incredibly impressive and so the open world aspects of this game don't really ring true like it feels very empty in the sense that there's just enemies wandering the map and every now and again there's a random treasure chest somewhere like there's not really there's no sense of exploration i feel and maybe that's also because the 3ds version has a map on the bottom screen and it kind of ruins some of the puzzles in the game because there's like there's this one moment where there's this hidden door but I'm looking on the map and I can see the hidden door leads to a room like it doesn't obscure that at all <laughs> so, so so some of the stuff like that I feel like original Dragon Quest 8 fans would be annoyed by uh, in this remake um, but generally as a remake goes I think it does a good job of streamlining things like adding that speed up option is great because it means that it's not a fucking 100 hour game it gets cut down much more um and uh, you can get through it at a, at a better better clip but it's done that's uh, that's now three dragon quests under my belt Bally. i've beaten <laughs> nine i've beaten seven and eight so these are the most recent three mainline dragon quests because dragon quest 10 is an mmo that never came out here it's only in japan and 11 is coming out i think this month in japan um so 11 is on... coming out soon on ps4 and 3ds which are the weirdest two platforms uh, to have the same game on, uh, yeah. but they look completely different. I think they're like story-wise the same and everything, but they will play somewhat differently. Uh, and then the Switch version will come out at some point, so maybe Switch is the time when you uh, give Dragon Quest to go, Bally. Uh, Could be. 11, 11 looks really nice, uh, and I think the PS4 version might be the one that we get on Switch. So, um, so yeah. Could that's, be good. Uh, that's a thing. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I I want to go back and play through four, five, and six, which are all on DS. They got remade on DS, so they're good versions out there. Um, so so we'll see. That's the next step in my Dragon Quest education. Uh, but after that, I was like, man, uh, I've got a bunch of stuff on Vita that I might pick up at some point. But I also had my Switch with me. It's the first time I brought my Switch on a trip, uh, and I I bought a case for it. It's a pretty solid case. I think it's 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 decent. I. Uh, I also got a USB-C wire so I can I basically I've left my dock at home with all the charging stuff and HDMI still plugged into it but I now have a USB-C cable that I can charge it off my laptop or charge it off just a, a power outlet so I can fit that in the case as well uh, and it's pretty solid I actually tried taking it out yesterday for a picnic and we ended up walking forever and I was just holding my switch in this entire walk and then we ended up going back because there was nowhere to sit for the picnic and so I just ended up not using it while I was out there so I was kind of bummed yeah. that I didn't get to use it in that setting uh, but uh, it's been good and it's, uh, I basically showed my cousin Zelda and stuff like that but 
Did they blow their like, mind? I need to play a game. Uh, not really, because you know they're like <laughs> they don't really have context. Because it's not for this FIFA stuff. on the bloody iPad. Uh, of course. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I was like, I need to play a new game on Switch. And I was looking at eShop. I'd um, been, you know, thinking of maybe picking up Snake Path because it was on sale. And then I didn't end up picking it up. And I was like, ah, I don't know. I need something else. And I saw the Giant Bomb Quick Look for Mighty Gunvolt Burst, uh, which Mighty Number no. 9, a game that has been reviled uh, in recent times because it was garbage and horrible and everyone hated it. Um, but I watched this quick look and Ben Pack's like, this is a, basically a Mega Man game and this is what Mighty Number no. 9 should have been. And I'm like, oh, okay, this kind of looks really cool. Uh, so it is basically a Mega Man game and it has some differences, like some kind of significant ones. Uh, a lot of the focus revolves around customizing weapons. So every time you go through a level, at the end, you get the opportunity to pick like uh, uh, either a new item that like, uh, enhances your weapon or uh, get a bunch of points um, and there's this, basically this point system where you can go in and kind of customize individual aspects it gets very very niche it's like how many rounds do you want to fire out at once and you can say like three which is the standard Mega Man or if you want to you can go down to two and have a bit more points to put into another area so you can be like oh I want my, my shots to curve upwards or I want them to go in a wave formation or I want them to be large or like medium or small so you have basically um, a set amount of currency that you can spend on all these different aspects and as you progress you gain more currency which means you can uh, enhance your weapon uh, and you also gain different abilities like so um, you gain like damage reduction so you can take less damage from enemies when you get hit and stuff like that so as you go through there's uh, a lot of replayability that's built into it because at the end of each level you get this choice and you can only choose one so if you want to play through the level again you can choose the other thing and get like more points or, or different weapons and um, hmm. it's a really cool way to do progression because it's not as focused on the bosses having specific weaknesses although I think they still might have specific weaknesses but I tended not to focus on that I was just like building myself up and eventually getting a character that was like taking a quarter damage had this kind of dowsing ability so I could find hidden objects in the level um had aerial dashes so you can like dash through the air when you're jumping uh, stuff like that that just adds to the build of your character and your progression as you go through um, and it just it looks really nice it's it's got a kind of more simplified pixel art style but it's really it's the sort of uh, look that you would expect a Mega Man uh, you know um, revival to have and that's what a lot of people thought Mighty Number no. 9 would do and then it went with this kind of 3D thing that look very ugly and just didn't perform very well because it was it wasn't as precise and kind of the pixel nature of those games mm. um and so this just fits that template much more it's interesting because it's not fully widescreen like it is basically letterboxed where the sides you have like kind of ui elements and the center is like kind of a um a four by three screen essentially on the switch is that um, in order to so feel more classic or is it just maybe because... I don't know. I think I think it probably is, and I think it's obviously to do with the level design as well, because Mega Man is kind of built around these separate rooms, and the rooms have a certain size to them and a certain feel to them, um, and so that kind of letterboxing probably works for that reason, makes it feel more like a Mega Man game because the kind of the places you're going through um, are designed in similar ways. And there are some cool mechanics in there. There's you know stuff where you have kind of disappearing blocks uh, and you know uh, stuff that w a kind of runbo level almost where like, like colors change in the background and platforms will appear and disappear stuff oh, like nice. that popping up like some neat things going on here um and you know you have the bosses you have a boss rush obviously and kind of wily's castle-esque thing at the end but it is uh like choosing things from a menu you can kind of go in any order you want and um and I just think it's a very streamlined kind of modern version of the Mega Man formula. There are no lives, uh, and you just get respawned if you die. And it just, in the bottom corner, it shows, like, how many times you've retried. And obviously, um, you know, people are like, oh, why is that a thing? You know, they want Mega Man to be hard, and they want you to lose lives. And I have always thought that... I like modernizations in games and I like it when you don't have to redo stuff you've already done and I appreciate this much more uh, for that reason. Um, but for people who like that stuff you can play it like an original Mega Man if you just want to restart the level. You'll be punished basically. Uh, it's it's very points focused. So at the end you get a score uh, and if you die you get a penalty. So if you want to get a high enough score you're not going to die essentially, right? So that's that's the way they deal with it which I think mm. is a nice compromise for those people. Um, and then, you know, 
you pick up like food items along the level which you're able to like heal yourself during boss battles and and it's just a really solid really good 2d game um and this was also interesting because it's the first time i've really used the d-pad on the switch which isn't a d-pad because there's a d-pad on the switch (laughs) yeah i know um and I was really worried about this uh, and this is why I kind of wanted to buy this game because I was like okay I I just want to see how this works and see if it is something I can deal with and I'm kind of surprised Bally that it's pretty damn good like it works way better than I thought it would and I didn't really have problems and in a game where there's not a, a Mega Man's never been huge focus on precision platforming there's certainly parts of it where you have to like nail jumps and stuff but it's more about the action plus the platforming but even with that it's it felt like i had a good amount of control over the character i was able to go where i needed to and avoid stuff and dodge out of the way um and and i think it was it works way better than it ought to you know hmm. um yeah so i guess what i'm saying is i'm not really afraid anymore to buy 2d games on switch because i think i can grin and bear it obviously it's not as good as a d-pad would be because nothing is uh but it's definitely better than using the analog stick for me personally i've never been a fan of using the analog stick in in games like this um, because it doesn't have the same kind of precision that i like um so i think i would maybe try the analog stick actually because i I played games like tropical freeze with the analog stick for example and so tropical freeze is a different case and Ori in the Blind Forest is also a different case because I think those games are more designed around an analog stick yeah perhaps. Um, something like this is much more throwback to a Mega Man style game and so it's it works better with a d-pad um, but yeah you, you can still get through those games with with the analog stick just fine I think um, just it just takes kind of changing your uh, brain to deal with it because my brain is very much geared into this 2d style of using a d-pad it's hard for me to break out of it uh, mm. generally um but uh yeah i don't know there's there's not a huge amount more to say about it aside from it's, it's kind of short so you know whatever but how much uh, did you it know, cost you it was nine quid it was 8.99 oh, on the switch bad. shop uh which was actually cheaper than snake pass was at 40 percent off so i so i kind of still feel a bit vindicated uh getting it and it's the kind of genre that i prefer i think to something like that but in any case uh yeah the switch is is now got me a new game on it which i've beaten again so now i need to buy something else i guess i'm just waiting for splatoon 2 now Splatoon is not far Um, away now it isn't but uh yeah i guess my final thought is yeah if you if you've been worried about playing these kind of games on the switch because of that lack of an option don't be too worried because i think you can get used to it oh the other thing i wanted to say is um i don't like the button placement uh for 2d games on the right joy con because the analog stick gets in the way and the original button placement for this game is using b and x which are closer to the analog stick on the right and when i'm trying to press them i feel my thumb knocking against the analog stick on the bottom Mm. so i had to go into the options and change it to a and y so i didn't have that problem but it feels like it's a bit too cramped on that right side when you're you, playing 2D you tend games. to stick your, your right thumbnail straight up in the air, sort of. So yeah. You're, 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 you're going to be close to that analog stick, I bet. Yeah, I am. And uh, it kind of sucks. It's maybe just a me problem, uh, but I I think that analog stick needs to be lower than it is. It's a bit too high for my liking. It's just a bit too cramped. Um, and it works perfect for 3D games, but when it comes to this stuff... I, I need to button remap because um, otherwise it's it's not a comfortable experience but um, yeah I would I'd recommend checking this out because it's uh, it's a solid game and it's only on Switch right now you can't get it anywhere else um, so it's it's definitely worth a, a timed worth exclusive a yeah probably I'm sure it'll come out on PC or, or somewhere else it's good, um, it's good Nintendo have arranged that though getting a few timed exclusives always helps a new system yeah definitely definitely um, and especially when Switch is not got as much stuff on it right now uh, it it helps to ease the pain for some people so anyway uh those are the games we've been playing that's the stuff uh hope you enjoyed and we will be back after this short break with a uh, some of your emails which you have sent to us so don't go anywhere we shall be right back
Hello everyone and welcome back to the show. It is time for the second segment and that of course means it is time for your emails. But before I get into the emails, MBZ, it's, it, th- that time has come again. It's looking bad. It's dire. The situation, is, we're literally dire. sitting on a hellscape and uh, the apocalypse is coming. The email well is dry. I mean, we're, we're just following E3. There's been like n- lots of Nintendo news recently. Like, Send us your emails. Like, We want your comments. We want your, your thoughts. Uh, and of course, the email address is thisnintendolife at gmail.com. That is this Nintendo Life at gmail.com. Please send your emails. We've only got two this week. That's how that's how oh, we're running. It's a, out it's a tragedy for sure. Uh, I should also add, if you're a new listener uh, and you just come on board recently and you haven't sent anything in, please do. We're friendly. We won't bite. So uh, so send your emails and we'd be happy to read them and uh, talk about them on the show. Absolutely. So our first email is from Tim E, who's from Visalia, California. Hello crew, I really enjoyed the minigames in Breath of the Wild. What have been some of your favourite minigames in all Zelda games, as well as some of the standout clunkers? Tim. So, it's funny because as soon as I saw this, I was like, man, can I think of a Zelda minigame that I actually like? You know, like, for me, the Zelda minigame spectrum has always been something that's like, oh, that's that's a nice little bonus to add on the side. But I've never really been engaged enough to really get into it right i think for a lot of people the original like really standout zelda mini game is fishing in ocarina of time right like that's True. the big one and fishing is something that returns in twilight princess i don't think it's in skyward sword i guess because there's not really water because you're in the sky um yeah i mean there is a little bit but you don't actually go fishing anywhere in that game um and i remember playing twilight princess and kind of enjoying the fishing stuff there like the fact that you get you rent out the boat and you can kind of sail out there there's also a heart piece that you have to get that's right. only available in the fishing mini game so that kind of forced my hand it's like i want the heart piece i'm gonna have to do this um but yeah do you remember like because when Twilight Princess came out, I think a lot of people struggled at the opening, especially on Wii, because the fishing was so difficult to do with the motion controls, and it was just yeah. a oh, bit God, of a faff. No, because the fishing controls for the mini game were separate to the fishing controls required as part of the story at the right. start. And the, the story at the start, like you're having to wait for... It's like a long floating rod that's actually in the water and then the rod in the water like has to get has to sink because something's grabbed it from below and like then when it grabs you have to just pull the Wiimote back and like well I had to look it up online loads of people had to look it up online because it's like so finicky and like the game never even tells you whereas the actual fishing part of Twilight Princess was really well developed I thought and it had you sort of with the nunchuck and the Wiimote you turn the Wiimote on its side I believe and then you'd like wind it back like a proper reel and it kind of it felt decent like it kind of you know that that era we're all up for um immersing ourselves using wiimotes and it kind of kind of worked yeah it totally was you know a time and place thing but i i do think that as much as people complain about the intro to twilight princess like i'm not too bothered by it but that part is every time i play twilight princess that's the part i get to i'm like oh for fuck's sake i have to do this again you know like it's that one part that really annoys me um out of all of it um, you know, I like I kind of like the the goat herding stuff. Like, I guess that's another mini game that's yeah. Twilight Princess. And you can like go back um, and do that and get another heart piece. So yeah, that definitely counts as a mini game. I, I I really obscure one, and I have a feeling you've not actually found this mini game because you mentioned you hadn't before. Is okay the baseball mini game from Link Between Worlds. I enjoyed yeah. that. It's like that's one that I never tried out because I was very mainlining Link Between Worlds. I didn't do a huge amount of exploring, so I never I don't think I ever found it because it's in the dark world, isn't it? I believe it is in low rule, I mean, low rule. Low um, rule, right, yeah. Yes. So I, it, it's it's sort of like in a forest to the southwest and it's just fun. It's just a basic timing game where you, you just press A to hit the baseball and you get trying to get a high score and you have to beat a certain score to get a heart piece. Like it's, I mean, Bali, you're a fan of baseball. I am a fan regardless, of baseball. right? So that makes sense that you would like the baseball mini game. Yeah, no, it, <laughs> that's one that stands other, out. Other good um, ones, Wind Waker. I I remember there being some sort of bombing, like as in ship bombing, uh, mini game. Right. Like it's on an island to the north east of the map. Um, and you're given points for bombing, essentially. Like, it, 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 it's repetitive fun. It's great. I, I enjoyed that one. I don't think I ever played that. I'm trying to think. 
because I did scour every island when I played through right. Wind Waker HD. Um, but I'm not sure I ever came across that kind of mini game. Wind Waker, you also mentioned MBZ that you know you got this. What maybe my favorite island in the game, or one of, and certainly my favorite dungeon is of course Dragon Roost and and that island. Uh, and and you meet the Rito, and there's all these rooms that connect their sort of living quarters, and then you've got the. The re- and they use the American naming system for the floors as we oh, found oh out God, when we were playing through yeah, again. Highlighted in our let's play, uh, but <laughs> they obviously are like famous for being the the postal people. Like they give you your post, they send post right. around the whole of High Rule, um, and they even have a post mini game, which is just a case of who can be the fastest menu. Yeah. It's <laughs> that's one that I remember, like you playing as a kid and just never being able to beat it, and just getting so frustrated, just constantly going again and yeah. again. I think you have to pay rupees to play it, right? Um, yeah, um, it costs something, and then there's a heart piece behind that as well, I believe. Yeah, um, that's the one thing that kind of bothers me by a lot of these mini games is they are paywalled. Uh, you know, yeah. like you have to spend rupees in order to have another go at them. They were like and... paywalls before paywalls were a th- were a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Nintendo was already in on game, it. Yeah, yeah, no, I, uh, I, the thing that um, generally for all these Zelda mini games that makes me think like they're not worthwhile is a lot of the times they're introducing brand new mechanics that don't seem as polished as the main game right like it feels like they spend so much time focusing on you know the combat mechanics and yeah. the dungeon design and the puzzles and everything working in sync and the mini games feel like they've been you know shipped off to some other team who's like added in this new part of the game that is only going to be used once at this certain instance and then thrown away and never really used again um which i just have generally thought is like no i i don't really care for those things because they're not as polished but like, would would zelda games be any worse if they didn't have mini games i don't know i think they add a lot of charm you know i think that's a that's mini game... definitely it they, they add so much char- they really give a depth to so many of the towns and characters and right things like that uh and yeah even in breath of the wild shall we talk about a couple of breath of the wild ones it's a little spoilery i don't know sure what is there anything that you got into that you found that you thought was fun so one that really frustrated me and i want your opinion because it's been a pretty central area so i'm pretty confident you've found it is um there's like a horse riding one where yeah the jumping over the um the uh uh, fences not bridges fences fences, Um, yeah right and my horse like i've got multiple horses um when they're not dying because that happens a lot in breath of the wild but I, I won't have get you into killed that. horses because none that of mine now. ever died none of yours have ever died no i've killed them about three or four times but anyway jesus um, like murder i'll save that here. for our uh spoiler cast uh but yes but uh yeah this horse riding one i just really really struggled like my horse would just refuse to jump over this particular fence at but no matter what angle and speed I'd jump over it would just would not jump interesting did you I, complete it I did yeah I beat that one and you got uh, a heart which piece which is weird it's not considering a piece, no how could uh, I say you don't. a heart piece in Breath of the Wild <laughs> I know no you get some a pretty cool reward actually like oh. it's a new saddle and stuff oh, it looks cool. awesome yeah no uh, I think they I actually on... tell you that that is the reward and then but anyway yeah i put it on sanjeet my horse uh, and he would look spectacular because there's also um there are people at the stables that can customize the yeah. look of your horse if you talk to them so he had like flowing pink hair and like this saddle that was all gold and shit he looked like a real badass it was awesome it was like when i was riding into the gerudo desert he looked like the sort of horse who would be riding into a desert and then i got to the edge and i was like oh i can't actually take my horse in the desert i'm yeah. sad so that, that was a bummer but um but actually that mini game and the thing i actually want to say about breath of the wild where i think it does mini games better than other zelda games is that most of the mini games found within are uh, contingent upon the mechanics of the game that have already been established mm. so stuff like the surfing game are using the environment you can shield surf everywhere so you have used that before and you're able to to know how it works and everything so once you get there like you can actually do it and not have to learn a brand new system right and i think the horse riding is similar to that because you're riding your horse everywhere all the time and you can jump fences and 
I think it was slightly different in, say, Ocarina of Time, right? Because that whole thing was based around a race, and you're never really racing your horse in any other part of the game, let alone around this kind of circular area. Um, so, you know, the whole uh, trying to beat whatever his name is, is is something that kind of happens once. Yeah, um, yeah. But, but yeah, but I, yeah I, I don't know. There's, I really there's like a lot of... the, the surfing in the game in Breath of the Wild, even though I've not actually been able to beat the very first level. Um, it's really hard. It's very difficult. Yeah, it's um, it's really tough. I don't I don't even know how you're actually meant to beat it. I might even look that up later. But anyway, yeah. No, it, it's cool. And like I just think the Breath of the Wild, they make more of an effort of using the environment. Like there's one mini game that's yeah. like, glide as far as you can. It's like, well, that's Oh, cool. yeah, that one's good. Uh, yeah, dude, there's it's... a crazy video of a guy basically getting to a Ventide Island from that spot. I've heard about um, this, yeah. It is actually insane. Like, wow. he uses bomb arrows on the ground to create fire so he can get another updraft oh. and just keeps going across wow. the map. He has, like, hundreds of bomb so arrows. So he's not it's actually crazy. really glitching it at any stage. He's just... No, he's, just... he's using the rules of the world that is... <laughs> and it well, works. Yeah, no. That's fantastic. I need to see that video. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I don't recommend watching the whole thing because it's like 30 minutes long. Oh, you, you can know? watch it double speed, You can skip through whatever. and see yeah. it. It's, it's yeah. kind of crazy. Well, that's really um, cool. So I just... Yeah, so stuff like that I, I really like in Breath of the Wild. I think generally it just it does a better job of contextualizing the game, the mini game within the world, right? Because the baseball thing in Link Between Worlds honestly makes no fucking sense. Like, why does baseball exist in that universe, yeah, you know? Whereas in Breath of the Wild, it's like, okay... Uh, this guy's challenging me to glide far i've been gliding a lot you know it it seems it makes sense within that environment exactly yeah and i I hope future zelda games try to do something similar to breath of the wild where they say here are the mechanics of the game we'll take so players who are really good at those mechanics can be rewarded through these mini games because say you're really good at gliding here you can glide sort of thing like if you're really good at shield surfing here's a mini game to shield surf and just incorporate it in rather than you know, how how is fishing ever going to help you defeat enemies or something like in the game? Well, you say that, Bally, and yet uh, the final boss of oh, right, yeah, can, can be distracted rods, with the yes. fishing rods. Yes. <laughs> it's kind of used it. in a different way, I might argue, but sure, it, sure. You're right, it is used in a different way, but the fishing rod gets its use out there. Um, before we stop talking about minigames, I need to give a shout out to Twilight Princess for being an arsehole, uh, for having the worst mini games. not only with the fishing, um, I think actually the one that I do like in Twilight Princess is the Goron Wrestling, which can be a little bit finicky. That's cool. But yeah. that's probably the best one out of the lot. But the whole r- River Rapids trying to shoot the shit going down on that boat, Oof. pain in the ass. That's hard. Uh, if you if you want to see someone get frustrated to all hell, watch my Let's Play of Twilight Princess on my other old channel. And uh, I'm not even going to say the fucking name of it because you can't. We'll, say, we'll do a tweet or something, don't worry. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, uh, or look up me trying to beat fucking Yetta in the snowboarding. Oh, uh, yeah. Which the snowboarding might be my least favorite mini game in any video game ever made. It's the most frustrating fucking thing in the universe. I think that might I actually be it. easier than the Breath of the Wild one, just saying. Uh, did you spend two and a half hours trying to get one run in Breath of the Wild? I don't think well, so. Well, I, I did the one in Twilight Princess a lot more easily than you've done it. And you did it when you were like 12 as well. well so. <laughs> Blow up my ego uh, even more. But yeah. Yeah. Anyway. So, yeah. That was an interesting chat about Zelda and the games. But... Yeah, good dive in. I, the, the, uh, the last thing I want to bring up regarding this, which we haven't talked about, is not necessarily a mini game, but the online multiplayer of Phantom Hourglass of, often comes to my mind because I've always thought that's a really cool idea that they've never gone back it's to. It's fun, yeah. The whole Stealth. Triforce, like, picking up and then uh, the other person's controlling the... Um, the guards, whatever they're called. Phantoms, um, yeah. The Phantoms, yeah. Uh, I, I just thought, like, oh, <clears throat> it's a way to do multiplayer in Zelda that isn't cooperative and instead is competitive. And it was a fun game. Yeah. I enjoyed it. That, that was a really good one. Really good one. But yeah, good good question, Tim. Thanks very much. Um, our next email is from JD. Hello, just want to say that your podcast is great and I enjoy listening to it at work. Quick question. If you could only have one game from each of these 2D Nintendo systems... What would that be from the NES, the Game Boy, the SNES, the Game Boy Color, the Game Boy Advance? Thanks for a great show, JD. All right. Uh, <laughs> so I guess it's kind of a bit of a Desert Island Disc situation here, Bally. 
got to choose one from each platform. That's hard. Uh, it's the, hard. the five Nintendo 2D platforms. It, I, I somewhat take issue with splitting Game Boy and Game Boy Color, but I guess you can kind of... You know, there are two eras of Game Boy. There's post and pre-Pokemon, which we've talked about a lot. Um, and I guess, you know, anything pre-Pokemon is more kind of Game Boy era uh, as opposed to anything post. Yeah, okay, fair enough. I, I, I'm, I'll i definitely be struggling on what's got, what's color and what's not. But anyway, we'll, we'll yeah. give it a go. Um, what should we sure. start with then? The NES? NES, let's start with. Yeah, it's probably the easiest one to, for me to knock out anyway. Because um, my answer is Mega Man 2. Uh, and I don't think there's another NES game that really comes close to it in terms of just fun and gameplay and level design and all that stuff. I just think that game... It, and it has a lot of bullshit. And I think that's the thing that, like, having played it a lot of times, like, I know it's bullshit, so I've kind of overcome it at this point. And I think that's a that's a lot of problems I have with people talking about NES games. Because most people who talk about NES games talk about their childhood with them, and they have fond memories because they played them tons, and the frustrating parts are not the parts that stuck with them, right? right? And uh, and there are, for sure, frustrating parts with Mega Man 2. Like, take the boss uh, where, you know, you have to blow up the, the walls and they fucking the shooting at you, the bomb yeah. boss. Oh, it's the fucking most bullshit boss in the entire game. Um, but I still really enjoy playing that game and uh, having beaten it for the first time, like, only a few years ago, uh, I think it stands up better than most other NES yeah. games out there. I'd be inclined to agree. I'm just trying to think of other games... NES games I have had a really good time playing, even if not for very much time. I'd I'd go with something like Balloon Fight, but honestly, yeah, I think good. I would side with Mega Man Two over that just because of I actually played that start to finish and had a really good time. Um, well, I mean, if it's just one game that you have with you, Balloon Fight's not a bad shout because yeah. I think that kind of endless mode of going, you know, the Flappy Bird style uh, is yeah, something that you can continue. Yeah, Balloon Trip, right. yes. Uh, you can continually better your score at and it's something that I feel is, is fun to, you know, just bash your head against a bit. Yeah. Uh, so I'll I'll go with Balloon Fight then, but I'm not I'm not the most I'm not overly fussed about my favourite NES game as I've played um I've had a I've had a good time with so few, let's just say. But Yeah. What's the next system? Game Boy? Yeah, the original Game Boy. Uh which I would I would probably go with so the easy answer is Super Mario Land 2 six golden coins mm. uh, which I love and I've played many times but I'm going to go with the first Wario Land actually because um, mm. that's one that I haven't played as much and I'm thinking if I'm on an island I'm going to be playing this a bunch of times the first Wario Land's really good and it's a very different style of platformer um, it's got some really fun levels in it and it's it's definitely a standout on the Game Boy uh, catalogue Um Cool. And uh, yeah, it's it's one of those series that I have somehow played most of the games in, uh, despite not really trying to. Like, I think the only Warrior Land games I haven't played are Warrior Land Three and the Virtual Boy one, which obviously it's very difficult to play the Virtual Boy one. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, that's a series that I really like. And out of all Nintendo's platforming series, it's the one that I want to most see make a return. Um, and it's just not been had anything done with it since. Uh, like the late 2000s when Goodfield made Shake Dimension. Yeah, so. absolutely. So yeah, I'm going to go with the, the original Mario Land. Game Boy for me is a real blank spot, actually. Like, it's it's weird. I think it's, it is for me as well, I, because a lot of these games I played through Virtual Console yeah. and stuff like that. And a, a lot of original Game Boy stuff was like, hey, Tetris, and like right. Game & Watch Gallery you had, and other stuff like yeah. that, I remember. So. And those are all sort of distant memories that I wouldn't really be like, right, that's my favourite game. And But when right. it comes to distant memories, slash, like, a game I've played recently that I just absolutely loved it's an obvious one but i'm gonna go with like pokemon red and blue or pokemon red like it's i as i said on the show i never beat that when i was younger i maybe got like four or five six gyms or something whereas i just played the whole thing through on 3ds when it came out on the virtual console uh just in when was it, it was 2015 i believe i played it not to, it was last year actually was it, last year? it, was, it last was last year, year. Yeah. yeah wasn't it 2016 yeah. so yeah Pokemon it was the start Red. of last year I think so yeah it was near the That's start um, one of the longer games I played last year but it just held up so much better than I thought it was going to uh, I didn't obviously it doesn't have save states that um, version um, right yeah it I doesn't about that. need them like it's just a really well designed fair game um i mean you know it's it's a game that we beat as children so it's not necessarily like it's one of those games that was designed for children in a right. sense so it 
doesn't require that you know save state scumming or anything no exactly and it just it just through. held up so well and had a good time um and yeah gold and nice. silver coming around the corner on on 3ds so might yeah speaking of gold and silver i'd probably choose that for my game boy color um if we're talking about that because you know it's not really strictly on the game boy color cartridge yeah, I know, because I remember the the real funny thing about it was I remember borrowing it from you because you owned it before I did. Because sure. I went to America in 2001. We actually both were in America at the same time back then. Um, and that was when I bought Gold and Silver and got myself a Game Boy Color for the first time. But I remember borrowing Silver from you and playing it on your old classic Game Boy um, and going up to that floor in... I can't remember what market it is. It's one of the big marts. It's in um, uh, freaking Goldenrod. Goldenrod. Goldenrod, yeah, that's the big city um, in sort of southwest. Yeah, and there's like a floor in there where you have to have a Game Boy Color to do a specific thing. Um, and I didn't have the Game Boy Color because I was playing on your original Game Boy, so I couldn't do the specific <laughs> thing up there, whatever it was. Um, and uh, I was like, ah, oh, bummer. But yeah, you're right because it could be played on a on an original Game Boy. Uh, right system but wouldn't have the benefits of of the color stuff so i'm pretty sure but, but i associate it with the color more so i'm pretty sure my game boy color pick also came out on a cart that actually works on um the original game boy even though it's a remake and that's uh not a remake a re yeah, i guess it's a remake to some degree. uh link's awakening dx oh right yeah um i'm pretty sure this didn't come out on a color cart as far as i'm aware even though it like added color and an so extra did dungeon. it did it um just take away that stuff if you played it on an original game boy system i don't the know DX i don't know because because what i would imagine is if they released the dx version you would think that it would only be color compatible right but i really don't have a good perhaps because there is a color dungeon isn't there yeah so i don't have a good knowledge of how titles would transfer between color and an original Game Boy. Like, it's one of my blank spots where I'm like, I don't actually know how that worked because back then I wasn't really, you know, I only had a Game Boy Color, so I didn't have anything to, like, compare or contrast mm. to. Um, and so it's not like now where we all know that, you know, the new 3DS can handle certain games and the old 3DS can't. Um, so, yeah, that's a curious one. But, you know, the the DX version of that absolutely is a Game Boy Color game because, you know, it was made for that system. Yeah. It was deliberately built. And uh, with that in it's mind it's a great game and holds up well i really enjoyed it uh we've been doing a bit of oracle dabbling we still got yeah an oracle oracle game each to play left but uh really great games yeah um what's next on the Here list we go. super nintendo oh man that's fucking hard that's really fucking hard isn't it um i i would probably go with Chrono Trigger, I think still, uh, despite not having played the um, the original Super Nintendo version, I still think that that's probably the best Super Nintendo game I've played uh, out of all of them. It's a very close race because Jesus, there are some excellent Super Nintendo games, and hell, we're going to be playing a bunch more when the Super Nintendo oh Classic boy. comes out, which we'll talk about in the next segment. Definitely, um, if we manage to hold on to our pre-orders, which you know, God willing. Uh, How, well, it's there anyway. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> yeah, let's not discuss that now. Um, but yeah, Chrono Trigger is a defining game. It's really, it's a shame that it's not on the Super Nintendo Classic because I've been waiting for a long time for you to have a chance to play it. Yeah, it's like, a somehow. real shame that one um, didn't make it. Because it is like the defining, it is the one everyone's been saying, oh, why isn't that on the system? Mm. Um, it's kind of the defining uh, game of, of that platform. So uh, it's uh, it's a shame it's not on there. But it's it's also one that actually works out if you were to say, hypothetically, just have that as being the only Super Nintendo game you're playing. Because you it was one of the first games to have multiple endings. And there are like 13 different endings. And like every time you do New Game Plus, you carry stuff over and you keep going. And I always remember Johnny Metz on RFN talking about how when he was younger, he would just play Chrono Trigger again and again and again. Mm. Like New Game Plusing like four or five times in a row. Because um, that was like, you know, when you're young, it's one of the only games you have. And, and so that's what you do is you just keep playing it. So um, it's definitely, you know, I only played through it once and got one ending, but there's a lot more to that game and there's a lot of interesting stuff that it does with time travel everyone's favorite uh, love it so, so yeah Bally, at some point you'll get there i think i'm gonna go with super metroid and 
it was tight between this and Donkey Kong Country, perhaps. Like, really? I, With I, Donkey Kong Country? I, I really, That's the competitor? I really Fucking like Donkey Kong Country. Well, Earthbound, of course. Like, I can't... Like, yeah, Earthbound. I thought Earthbound would definitely be... Yeah, I think... Choosing. Yeah, you're right. I think I'd probably put Earthbound above Donkey Kong Country. But um, I love those three games. But Super Metroid, the best of the bunch for me. Uh, this was the... I always get this confused, and you always correct me. Well, which it's order did I play Metroid 2D game Metroids you in? Played. You played Fusion first. Fusion first, which I thought was the hardest. Um, and then Probably I played is, um, Super Metroid next, and I was actually like, this is actually a bit easier. And then after that, we obviously played Zero Mission, and I was like, this is a, a cakewalk compared to yeah, like Zero Mission is a cakewalk Fusion generally. and Super Metroid. But I, I think Super Metroid does eeriness and exploration and all these great things i've talked about numerous times on this show about uh about metroid and it just works so well uh and mechanically it it, it holds up the mechanics don't aren't like perfect and they're definitely not as slick as a, like a zero mission or something or a fusion in terms of that aspect but as a super nintendo game it is definitely my favorite yeah it's it's an all-time classic for a reason i would really like them to remake it I, I, oh, mean, I think I they will already, at some point. They're already remaking another Metroid game. Oh boy! So, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know they'll they'll probably. So here's a, here's a pattern that I've seen emerging, Bally, that I think actually holds up theor- theoretically, and why I think Su- Super Metroid will be the next Metroid game to come out. Um, is they made four Metroid games that are 2D, and then they remade the first one, and now they're remaking the second one. What are they going to do next? They're going to remake the third one. So yeah, the pattern, the pattern is coming. Perfect. Um, well, what's the what's the third one? Fusion. No, Super Metroid. Oh, sorry, of course. Because Metroid Got Two you. is uh, is being remade right now. So. Got you. Got um, you. so yeah, now the final system would be Game Boy Advance then, which is really difficult to choose because I have a lot of Game Boy Advance games that I love dearly. Um, but I would probably say the first Fire Emblem. Uh, is still there. Uh, despite Metro Fusion being probably my all-time favorite, uh, I'm going to choose the first Fire Emblem because it's an experience that is kind of infinitely replayable and actually has a lot more to it that I've not even touched, like the Hector mode that you can do, like hard Hector mode, which has like exclusive maps to it and has like a slightly tweaked story. Um, there's a bunch of like uh, stuff you can unlock by beating the game multiple times. Mm. And there are so many different characters that you can go through it and have different experiences. Yeah. Any, any so, Fire Emblem um, game is infinitely replayable for that reason, isn't yeah, it? It's just, totally. it's just really, and it's a really well-made one, this one. It's just yeah, it's, it's the solid, solid game, so... I would just go with that. Um, mine's fairly predictable as well. I'm going to go with Advance Wars, the first one. Um, I've still got to play the second one. It's on my Wii U. I need to do that. It's ridiculous. I've not it's done stranded that Stranded on Wii U now. Now you anyone just wants to play Switch I just Switch want stuff. to play it on my glorious Switch, but it's not there. But anyway, yeah, I, I need to play two. But one is... You played one last year. Um, it's a fucking difficult game. It's a- <laughs> <laughs> apparently it's a really difficult game i think it's a moderately difficult game and i obviously struggle more with fire emblem but it was really interesting for you to play it um and it's really good i you know i still stand by i think it's a really well made excellent game yeah, but it's just there's some uh there's some maps that i'm like Who's, how can a fucking human do this you know like <laughs> <laughs> blew my mind a little bit but. yeah so you know I know Intelligent Systems, you know, they've been quite busy with their good old Fire Emblem, but, you know... Their I'll old keep... waifu simulators going on. I'll, I'll keep the Advance Wars flame going. And obviously there's um that <laughs> Advance Wars-like coming out. I've forgotten the name already. Wargroove. Wargroove coming out later this year? It's not confirmed this uh, Yeah, year. it should this be year? a 2017 game, yeah, I so I'm, I'm very intrigued to see what that looks like. And probably... they, uh, they showed quite a bit of gameplay of that at E3 during the PC gaming show. They had the developers oh. on stage. They showed off the map editor, um, which looks really good. Um, and uh, yeah, they uh, they played a, a bit of the game and showed how you know the heroes work and all that stuff. It's, it's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, so you should probably check that out. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so yeah, looking forward to that. Yeah. And, and that's that's a wrap that's that's our game yeah so uh yeah that's uh gonna be emails for this week but as we said at the top of the show please send in emails we actually do need a lot of emails now so please yes. send them in. it's really useful um and i'm sure there's lots of interesting things for uh, us to talk about uh right now so uh go ahead get on that the email address is bally this nintendo life at gmail.com that's this nintendo life at gmail.com please send them in we need more 
we need them dearly because you like listening to them we like reading them out you know it's a bit of a, a, bit, of a, a, bit, of a bit, bit of back and forth every, symbiosis they every call podcast it about it. symbiosis it. exactly Sim- like what is a podcast without its email segment we need emails I know so there we go yeah, but okay. um, anyway that's all the emails for this week join us after the break where we will be going through a few news stories that piqued our interest recently everyone welcome back to the third and final part of the show today wherein we will be discussing a few significant news items that have been happening past couple of weeks uh, and uh, they are pretty significant uh, one of which has sent the internet aflame the other of which has also set the internet aflame so nintendo just burning down the web as per usual uh, which is is what we expect of them these days I this feel. is there's quite a lot going on considering like e3 is just finished yeah, it's weird that Nintendo have these announcements and they're just like, okay, we'll wait until E3's done and then like, we'll just drop the, yeah, this two, shit. Yeah, like two weeks after E3. Not just like a month or two after E3. Two weeks after E3. Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of people tend to say this nowadays and I think a lot of people don't like to hear it, but Nintendo doesn't really focus on E3 as their be-all and end-all anymore. Um, you know, a lot of games companies tend to be okay, we're going to show this game at E3, then we're not going to show it until next E3. You know, like, stuff like God of War at Sony was like, no one saw anything of that for a whole year, and then it's E3 again. Like, that's what they treat that show as. Whereas Nintendo are like, oh, we can just do directs and a bunch of shit whenever we want. Right. Uh, and so they kind of just don't have it as a bigger deal anymore. Despite the fact that they kind of, you know, stole the show this year's E3. So they they can kind of do whatever way they want, pal, it turns out. <laughs> Nintendo, they're in charge. Um, so let's kick things off uh, talking about the Splatoon Direct, which happened uh, a few days ago, uh, which was more of kind of an update on what the hell is going on with Splatoon, what modes are going to be, and, and just kind of fleshing it out a bit more. And I have to say, just a uh, base impression, I have become way more sold on Splatoon than I was before. Um, I think that they have shown off a significant amount of stuff. I think it's just been a gradual build of my impression of Splatoon, where when we first saw the Switch trailer, that commercial, I was convinced it was just going to be a port of Splatoon that we were getting, because that made sense, it was an easy thing to do. Um, even after seeing you know, the stuff of the January event, I was still like, well, it doesn't look like they're doing that much to differentiate, but over time they announced Salmon Run, they showed that there's a brand new single player, they've shown there's no- new maps, like brand new weapons, a lot of like more fleshing out stuff has been happening, and this Direct was just like, okay, now we're solidified that this is, this feels like an actual bigger sequel than I thought it was going to end up being. Right. Uh, what was your impression overall of, of what they showed us? It doesn't feel like there's huge announcements within this direct or, or with no. this game generally. It's just, but they're just lots of little things that just come together to make you think, right, I need to buy this game. Like, this is, they're offering like a lot of stuff. And like, for me, the highlight is definitely Salmon Run. Uh, I know that, like, we can maybe just talk about it now, but like, it is limited but maybe that's actually a better way of doing it in terms of like the stats you can get on it and like the 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 competition aspect of it and you know making sure everyone's online at the same time to do it or something i don't know it's maybe it's interesting like i think that that mode is maybe what i'm the most excited about followed by the new single player just because those are two things that obviously the first platoon didn't have and like it's just i mean a, this first platoon had its own single player but this right is a new but one. like a new single player and it feels new... like it's it has more of its own identity uh there's there's a lot of really cool mechanics being thrown in there i still stand by the idea that it kind of feels like the the mario galaxy effect is still there with like the floating platforms and stuff in space but uh you know the the fundamentals of this platoon single player campaign 
campaign were, were good uh, and I just thought they needed to flesh it out a bit more and add a bit more um, uh, you know make it a bit more Nintendo with some crazy weird things going on yeah. and it looks like they have that um, with the single player but going back to the, the, the salmon run stuff you said it's limited what we should probably explain that is that essentially it's going to be time windowed right so like the splat fests or like the um uh, the test fire that they did beforehand there's going to be a time window when you can play salmon run and then it goes away for a bit and then it comes back so it's interesting because a lot of people have been like kind of negative on this and i was like oh well, the first time i saw it i was like mm, don't really know what to think about that because it seems like why would you like window off a whole mode right like it seems like yeah. you'd want people to be able to play as much as possible uh but it makes some sense if you think about it in the context of okay maybe the the type of waves and the kind of different types of enemies they're going to send at you are going to be universal for everyone and they're going to do these different like uh styles of them over the different days so like one day you get this specific boss enemy at the end of it and another day they change it up like they're 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 making it so that each day can be like kind of leaderboards where everyone's getting the same content and everyone's trying to play through it as best they can right? and that'll make you arguably come back from more more so than if you were just given it all on a plate like on day one where you could just access it right. anytime like this idea of like time it makes it a bit special almost. time windows yeah it's a bit special it's like oh i, I want to be involved in the tournament that everyone else is doing like i want to see how well i can defeat that boss versus someone else and like they really did show that there's like a real variety of like they're just weird looking it's like these salmons that control these contraptions and the other ones are just like genuinely huge salmon and like oh it's just weird it looks intriguing like you want to fight them you want to give it a go and and honestly the time windows are not that bad they are basically 24 hour periods so it'll be from like 5 p.m one day to 5 p.m the next day and then maybe it'll be like a two-day break where you can't play it and then they'll jump back in for a couple of days and sometimes yeah. a one-day break like it seems like in terms of fixing a time to play it you should be able to do it no problem uh so it's not like single hours because i was worried it was going to be just like one hour at a time which is like come on guys like that's that's a bit ridiculous but the other thing that makes me not too worried about it being windowed like this is there's so many other modes in splatoon 2 like having the single player plus the standard turf wars plus ranked mode like that's a bunch of stuff that a lot of people are just going to be getting on with anyway um and so i'm not too worried um and they've also added like they've added freaking like a fucking rhythm mini game to this thing you know that like, was weird what, what how, how does that fit into the game like in terms of what do you what's the benefit I, I, it... I don't know i i think it's kind of you know with the wii u gamepad they had the ability to do those mini games on the second screen it might be like that you're right and now they don't have that anymore so that's why i'm thinking they're kind of putting that in there as a kind of a bonus thing maybe squid jump will be there as well to you wait know? for your game to learn yeah exactly um uh, and and they also you know speaking of wii u lost features not having the miiverse means a lot of people would be disappointed because a lot of the charm of the original splatoon was the drawings in the plaza yeah um and they said that they basically made their own miiverse it's not really miiverse it's just hey you can just draw within splatoon 2 and uh, those drawings will be shown off to people in, uh, in the yeah. Splatoon plaza which is nice it, it's it's nice to see them paying attention to stuff like that because it's a lot of what had you know splatoon the original you know gave a lot of charm by adding that stuff in there um mm. so it's nice to you see can them kind of you can now even speed up that horseshoe crab who tells you all about your weapons right yeah oh god that was really annoying you know what i really like is they add a skip button to the the new pop star hosts that we have uh who we can maybe move oh, on to um so we have pearl and marina they gave this little uh concert at the end uh more of a rap concert more than anything else like pearl seems to be the the main rapper and marina the dj at the back um and they have basically replaced callie and marie uh who are somewhere within the single player mode it oh, seems because we, we saw that, that In screenshot intriguing but, and they really yeah, sort of dangled that video. carrot saying like oh yeah they're here somewhere we're just not going to say oh Find out exactly yourself. there's gonna the be something in the story that you know whatever fucking story splatoon has that anyone cares about um <laughs> oh, but uh, but these characters people have latched on to immediately well they've more latched on to marina than than pearl which you know that's what the internet's gonna do uh but uh marina it looks like an octoling as opposed to a, a squid because she has like the the kind of thingy coming down from her hair it looks like an octoling i don't know that's what people have been saying so like a, i have no idea yeah tentacle that's what that's the word i'm looking for yeah um 
but they seem cool. I I like that the music style has kind of shifted with them. You know, like it's more it's taken on a more hip hop vibe, uh, which everyone loved the music from the first Platoon because it was just so fucking weird. Um, it like it had these like Japanese pop aesthetics to it, but also this strange twist on it that made it very unique. And I think they're kind of doing the same thing here, just with a different genre of music. Um, right. Yeah. No, it's interesting. It's like they've really just gone for it, saying. Yeah, we're gonna create two more like iconic characters, and they're gonna be the center of this game. And like, also, they need to sell more amiibo ballets. Yeah, it it just (laughs) all plays into like the style Splatoon's going for, where people will buy these (laughs) buy these amiibo. Like, it's a pretty smart thing to do. You know, if you latch onto the characters, that's what you want to do. Yeah, definitely. Like, Um, while Splatoon, while while. the, like the inklings themselves are relatively faceless in the sense that like they're not characterized as in named um like the other characters in this game they've really put a lot of effort into in terms of making sure that you identify with them and like you know they're Callie and Marie they sing you vote with them on Splatfest like it's, it's like a thing like it, it's just part of that thing that they Nintendo likes to do to fami- familiarize yourself with what they're trying to insert upon your brain i guess <laughs> it's a lot of world building basically that's the word yeah. i'm like for world yeah. building <laughs> what am i trying to word that yeah no I, I think that's important because them not having the inklings be defined characters because you kind of make your own exactly um, you know, having having defined characters is important i think to to the character of that game more than anything else um so so that's cool and it's also cool that to see just nintendo advancing and you know having more you know people of color and variety in in their characters and, yeah. and you know, there was a tweet that i saw going around showing like man nintendo are really getting a bit more progressive here like having uh you know the gerudo and urbosa and stuff like that in breath of the wild and then twin tell and arms and now marina in in splatoon 2 it's, yeah. it's cool and it's also because they received a lot of criticism when it came to animal crossing on 3ds um one of the oh, God, you know, yeah. famous austin walker articles uh, that got him his name out there was the one where he was talking about constantly trying to tan his character in Animal Crossing because there were no kind of skin color options in there. Um, and that's something they've corrected with Happy Home Designer, and I'm sure the new Animal Crossing will do as well. But just a nice thing to put out there, the mm. Nintendo being more inclusive. Um, uh, and then there's uh, the Nintendo Online app, which is a big part of this, uh, that they showed for the first time. So we kind of saw what it looked like. And, and it seems like the Nintendo Online app is going to be this hub that houses apps for individual games or like sub uh, sections for individual games kind of like the Miiverse did where you would have like different boards that you could post on but the Splatoon 2 one is called Splatnet 2 and it's kind of housed within the Nintendo online app and within it you can actually see a bunch of different stats like go around see uh, all the players you've been in the last 50 matches with how, how much your accuracy is done all that stuff with all your different weapons um, and just being able to connect with other people through voice chat and apparently through social media as well uh, and so this i was kind of telling you uh, before we started recording this is one thing that stands out to me as like potentially really cool about the app is being able to post directly to twitter or facebook or whatever from the app and have people just simply click a link and be joined to a lobby from their phone you know like that seems like an actual smart way to do it because everyone is logged into social media on their phone already right like that's the thing that actually makes sense when you're thinking about why the hell nintendo doing this through a smart device there's mm. a possibility that it could be streamlined in that way. But I'm not going to hold my breath, Bally, because Nintendo often fuck things up like this. Yeah, and like, do we know that the app only works like as an app on your phone and like it just does not work on a laptop and it does not work on the Switch itself? Do we know that yet? I believe so, yeah. I believe that's what they've said. Oof, bold. Oh, quite yeah. <laughs> It is. It's. Uh, we've gone from a Nintendo who didn't want to acknowledge smartphones existed to one who's like, you have to use one for our system. <laughs> so, a little weird, a little weird. But I, I'm interested. It's it's gonna launch uh, on the day Splatoon Two comes out. So that's 21st of July, um, and it's gonna be free for six months because the online service isn't coming till 2018 probably longer than six months because I doubt it'll be first of January 2018 they start charging you. Um, so we have time to acclimatize to it to see what we like about it to see whether it works uh, i think this is a real proof uh of test of current no i can't think of the phrase it's it's uh it's test Nintendo's... of character 
uh, well, maybe it's it's Nintendo's time up to bat. You know, they've got to they've got to prove their metal with uh, this new application and whether it actually does the job that people need it to do, um, and whether it's clunky and, and all that stuff. So we shall see. But uh, it's it's exciting nonetheless to see them trying something with online that is maybe a bit more progressive. Uh, and just and to then, sweeten the uh, deal, they've just decided let's just do a splat fest before the game even comes out. Exactly, and it means that everyone gets access to it—a bit of hype building before the release date. Uh, and Cake that or is ice cream? On the fifteenth of July, uh, and the eternal question is indeed cake or ice cream, Bally. Uh, which you know, I don't want you to reveal right here because oh, how spoil. could I reveal that? It's a very secret. What team I'm going to be playing on the oh, so, Such a secret. Um, so yeah, that's great. I'm. I already. I just downloaded the app today. Just went live on the eShop. Um, so I will be jumping in to to play some Splatoon 2 before it comes out, and and then get it on on launch day. I'm actually. I'm really looking forward to this game now, Bally. Um, and I think one of the things that really emphasised that was some of the new weapons and stages they were showing off. Was like we've seen some of these already, which they've shown in like previous Splatoon 2 stuff. But once you put it all together, it feels like a more complete package, right? It's like, looking great. It, it looks good. Uh, there's there's going to be post-launch support, and they have said one year after the game comes out, so the first full year, there's going to be updates constantly. And then for the first two years, they're going to have Splatfest constantly. So seems like a great, uh, you know... Time window. W- yeah, it's a and, great and, um, I mean, amount they can of stuff always, they're putting out there. They can always change that. If, the, like, if, if this game just sells gangbusters, and they're like, you know what? let's make more content they can always do that you know the, uh, you know what they a, can a also do is they can leave the window open for a paid expansion or like bigger DLC right. down the line like at the end of that year they could say okay you had all this free content the game is great now what if we give you like an, a bonus single player mode or something more significant to expand upon the game um, you know and not have to do a Splatoon 3 straight away um, right. which you know gives it even more longevity and lets people just stick in the ecosystem so, so yeah, it's it's looking great, and I want to play with that shotgun umbrella because that looks fucking awesome, and that's going to be one of the post uh, update items uh, or weapons and they bring into. They've the not game. announced any new ranked modes yet, but I'm sure there will be a few more. No, so it's the same ranked modes. What I will say is that I am a big fan of tower control. I think that's an awesome mode. Ooh, I prefer uh, the other they've... two more than tower control. You're crazy, about Rainmaker what the hell? is so cool. I, I love uh, it. Uh, Rainmaker I didn't play enough of because it kind of came out when I was tailing off Splatoon Um, but I remember us playing a bunch of tower control together and really enjoying that yeah Um, no that's that's a great mode I like I think that's my favorite Uh, but also they are they're now splitting the um, your individual ranks between those three uh, modes really nice yeah so so you don't have to be just like one single rank um, does that mean you can mode. pick anyone at any time? I don't think it does, actually. Nope, you can't. Yeah. They've still done it uh, in that way. And that's Fair the enough. one thing I think I'm I'm not happy about with Splatoon 2 is they've kept their idea of, oh, this these two maps for this hour and then these two maps for the next two hours, you know? I don't like the way that they use maps like that. It's it's It made sense for the first Splatoon because it launched quite bare bones with not very many maps. At this point... I don't think it works anymore, um, and I really would like them to shift that system. But There's also returning maps, which is nice. Yeah, the uh, freaking Moray Towers. Moray Towers and um, um, the container port one. Yeah, the the, the cargo area. Mackerel port. Mackerel port, probably. Yeah, something like that. Something, um, like something oh, warehouse. fishy. Walleye Warehouse, I think, was in there. Um, but yes, those uh, are back and looking good. And yeah, generally, Splatoon 2 looking great. So, uh, that's that. Let's move on next to the big dog, the one that really set the internet on fire. Oh, God. The Super Nintendo Entertainment System SNES Mini Classic Edition Micro Mini Console successor to the NES Mini. It was real, pal. The Eurogame were right. The rumors were correct. Uh, it's coming out. So, let's talk about it, because some crazy shit happening with this device. Uh, it's launching for 80 quid, which is $80, thanks Brexit, um, and uh, it's going to come with 21 <laughs> games, as opposed to the 30 of the NES Classic, which some people will complain about, but quite honestly, I think it's fine, given the, not only the lineup, but also the uh, quality and um, breadth of games and, and depth of games as well that we have. Uh, so let's run through the list. Uh, which contains Contra 3 The Alien Wars, Donkey Kong Country, Earthbound, 
Final Fantasy 3, which I'll get back to because, Bally, you don't understand Final Fantasy. Uh, F Zero, Kirby Superstar, Kirby's Dream Course, Legend of Zelda Link to the Past, Mega Man X, Secret of Mana, Star Fox, Street Fighter 2, Turbo, Hyper Fighting, Super Castlevania 4, Super Ghouls and Ghosts, Super Mario Kart, god damn it, there are a lot of Super games on the Super Nintendo, by the way. <laughs> Who the uh, thunk Super it? Mario RPG, Legend of the Seven Stars, Super Mario World, Super Metroid, Super Punch Out, and Yoshi's Island, which is also Super Mario World 2, Yoshi's Island. And it's also crazy that that's coming because they couldn't even render it on a Wii U. E- exactly, but the big piece de resistance, Star Fox 2, wow. is also coming Just, to wow. this device. Um,. So let's uh, let's maybe talk about the lineup generally, and then jump into some of the specifics. Uh, this is a hell of a goddamn it's so list. It's so flawless. Valley. It is so flawless. Like we, well, it's not flawless as we mentioned in the previous segment. Chrono Trigger could bear to be on it, right? But for sure, how many games on Super Nintendo beyond Chrono Trigger can we think of that are missing? Uh, I would say Final Fantasy two slash four is one that a lot of people would want. Fair enough. Um, there's some there's some RPGs out there that I think people are like interested in having on here, but. I don't know, it's, it's hard to think of, like, all-time classics that are just not included on this list, you know? Like, you look down here and most of them are just standouts. Um, it's... it's got literally all the Mario games. Like, it's... it's I There's so many games on here that I've not played that I want to play, and that's a huge reason why, like, I'm, I want to get this day one and, like, want to pick it up. Because... Yeah, and it's also the fact that the Super Nintendo, just as we have talked about and as we you know generally discuss on this podcast is a system that we care way more about as you know the 16-bit era was really when games got going like you know nes games are hard to go back to super nintendo games feel like they came out yesterday like they they are just so great still today um and so it's it's really good to see a lot of stuff on there um but star fox 2 like the, the the history between about Nintendo and this game and how it was almost about to launch but then all of a sudden the PlayStation 1 came out and all this other stuff came out like it's crazy that that game now in 2017 is back and is being released by like Nintendo officially like it's crazy this game qualifies for game of the year 2017 Bally <laughs> technically <laughs> you know this is the first release of Star Fox 2 it's, it's ridiculous like you think about all these fan bases that have been waiting for sequels for year, years, you know, like Last Guardian are 10 years in development and, you know, that's that's horrendous. And same with Final Fantasy XV, like so long. People have been waiting for a sequel to Star Fox since the fucking, like, early 90s. So uh, here it finally is. And, uh, man, you know, this game has been out there in various forms. Uh, ROMs leaked out. I remember few years ago someone sent giant bomb a snes cartridge that had had the rom applied to it oh, so you could yeah. technically take the cartridge and put it in a super nintendo and play star fox 2 which i thought was a cool thing for like a fan project to go out there and actually make a, a cartridge it would be amazing if they like released a super nintendo cartridge with this on it which you know of course they're not going to do that so this is the next best thing is put it on their their classic console but uh i'm very interested because I've never played the original Star Fox. It's never really been re-released anywhere, as you mentioned with Yoshi's Island, because of the Super FX chip and all those games that had that as part of its technology. It's been either hard to emulate, or I also saw someone talking about um, the copyrights or something expiring on the FX chip recently. So oh, it might be a combination of the two. Um, but now FX chip games can be played again on this system. Um, and there are three major ones, which is the original Star Fox, Star Fox 2, and Yoshi's Island, because uh, you played the GBA version, right? Right, yeah, I've played the GBA twice now, but uh, n- never the, the SNES original. Yeah, and that's the one that everyone talks about. Uh, and maybe that one won't make me motion sick. Who knows, Bally? <laughs> Miracle's going to There's care. a chance. We should, so... we should also mention, like, this system is coming with two controllers. Like, that right. completely... Like, we can do low couch. I say couch co-op, it's not co-op, but like Mario Kart, Super Nintendo, yeah. just playing against each other, battle mode. bit of battle mode going on for sure, that's possible. Uh, Secret of Mana is a multiplayer kind of RPG that you can play through with three people actually, but they only have two controllers. That'd so be it's cool, could wouldn't be two. it? Uh, yeah, man, I really want to play Secret of Mana with you, that'd be awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, there are a bunch of games on here. I think... There is a there's might be a multiplayer mode in in um, 
freaking super punch out maybe I, I don't know about that and f-zero uh, f-zero has one i think um yeah there's there's a dog on country can you do multiplayer in that the two with, with Diddy. I don't. I'm not sure. I'm not. I'm sure. not sure. And I think even if you can, it's not that great. <laughs> I know the Kirby Superstar. You can for sure. Um, nice. In the in the kind of Metroid style mode, which I can't remember what that's called, but that's something that people love about that game. Um, but yeah, going down this list, is there anything that stands out to you to, to like? Oh, that's the first thing I'm going to play when I switch on this NES Classic. Or are you going to go back to a favorite? Are you going to boot up Super Metroid first? Um, what do you think uh, you're going to go to first? I, I just want to dive in, and do a few GPs on like Super Mario Kart. To be honest, like, oh really? Okay. I, I've never really played more than ten minutes of that game before, and I absolutely love Mario Kart, and I really want to try. I'm I'm gonna. St- I'm going to definitely either start sort of like Link to the Past or Super Metroid again. Probably Super Metroid just because that's my favorite uh, And it's game. also very quick to play through. It's very quick to play through. It's games. quite easy to pick up and play. This obviously has save states like its uh, NES brother. Uh, and it has multiple save states actually if it's the same as the NES which one. Which is uh, fantastic because you can just pick up and play a few... Uh, can you do a save state for every game? I, I assume not. Yeah, but... yeah. There's there's save states for every single okay, game, and perfect. there are multiple save states for each one. Oh, multiple, so you can for have each like one. Perfect. three or yeah. something per. per Fantastic. Uh, so game, I'll so. probably go straight back into that, and then I really want to just start one of these RPGs, either like Secret of Mana with you, or Final Fantasy, or I don't know. Probably not Earthbound again yet, but. No, Definitely but eventually. I'm glad Earthbound's on there because it's a so game I will return there. to at some point for sure. Easily, like that game is super special. We talked about that so much at the end of last year. Um, yeah, it's a classic. Um, yeah. So, Bali, do you want me to explain the Final Fantasy situation to you because you have no yeah. idea? Yeah. What am so, I missing? Yeah. What's What's going on? So it says Final Fantasy three on there. Um, that's not actually Final Fantasy three. That's the American Final Fantasy three. So here's how it went, Bali. They released the original Final Fantasy in America, and they called it Final Fantasy. And that is Final Fantasy 1. That is Final Fantasy 1 in Japan, it's Final Fantasy 1 in America. Then they released Final Fantasy 2 and 3 in Japan, and they never came out in the US. Then they released Final Fantasy 4 in America, which they called Final Fantasy 2, because it was the second one they'd released in America. So Final Fantasy 2 in America is Final Fantasy 4. Then Final Fantasy 5 came out in Japan, which they didn't release, and then Final Fantasy 6 came out in Japan, and they released that in America. So America basically got 1, 2, and 3, which are actually 1, 4, and 6. Okay? So right. Final Fantasy 3 on here is the American Final Fantasy 3, which is actually Final Fantasy 6. So... That's why everyone's excited, because 6 is, like, revered as the best Final Fantasy by a lot of people. It's an all-time classic, and it is one that I have been wanting to play for fucking ever. So the first thing I'm going to do is is play that, for sure. And, and how easy is it for someone like me to pick up and play? I think it should be quite easy. Um, I think a lot of people have said that... It's a good learning curve. Yeah, it, it's probably one of those games that, on the Super Nintendo, not many people have played like a lot of rpgs back then so i think it is relatively friendly to newcomers Mm. and you know chrono trigger is another game which is similar to that where it is very friendly and i think both these games are talked about in a similar breath so you should have no problem jumping in and what people love it so what's your view of super castlevania 4 so it's an interesting one because i've never played it but i have watched it a few times i watched uh vinnie caravella play through when he was doing his run through of all the castlevania games uh, yeah. i think i watched nintendo capri sun play through it uh it, it's the same style as castlevania one through three uh so it's a side-scrolling level based affair um it's very weird graphically. I don't think I particularly like the graphic style. It's more kind of chunky. It's a very big character. Um, but the whips are much more dynamic than in the original games. And you also have, like, jump control. So it's uh, it's a really solid game, I think. I don't think it's as good as something like Rondo of Blood, which uh, came out afterwards. Um, but Super Castlevania Four is thought of as a pretty damn good Castlevania game. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm interested in playing it myself because I've watched it a few times. And uh, you know, having played the first Castlevania and then doing all the Metroid ones, uh, this is one that I've uh, been curious about. But it's the sort of thing I don't think I would pick up and play of my own accord. So just having it in here is nice. Um, and I think it's also a good one to just start with for you. So, so the the whole announcement of the SNES Classic was kind of like a little 
a little plaster to put over that huge cut that was left in us having that with there being no virtual console announcement at e3 like this was yeah. just like okay you're not getting your virtual console just yet if at all we can get onto that but here's the snes classic where does nintendo go now when it comes to like classic games and how we play them like are we are we is the n64 classic going to come in the near future will it then go into gamecube classic will th those games be less playable on the most recent nintendo system when we're talking about switch how do they balance the two and like does this mean that super nintendo games won't be on the switch or are they less likely to be a la carte i really think that Nintendo are trying something new and I don't know how it will work and whether it will be successful but it feels like they are trying to rebrand and do something different and make their virtual console stuff or like classic games feel less like you're being gouged for them and more like you're getting bang for your buck and right. so by doing that in a couple of ways one through the mini consoles paying a single price and getting a ton of games and two through their online subscription which is paying one price and getting and a bunch of games game. so you're not anymore paying for individual games but the the worry i have with that is a lot of these niche games that are rare and not very popular may not pop up anymore right like if they get rid of the a la carte model then what happens if you want to play something incredibly rare that no one really has heard of and is just this kind of piece of history that someone wants to go back to? And I yeah. know a lot of people won't buy that, and that makes sense, right? Because it's niche. But there are people like me and, you know, eventually down the line probably you who will want to dig in and find out, you know, more about the deeper cuts of the Super Nintendo library and, and, and go in deep yeah. there. So so that's my worry is if they go down this route and just have the subscription, it kind of cuts that stuff out. Um, and what if the subscription genuinely only works for games before, say, the Millennium? And right. then everything after is a la carte, so like GameCube games. For yeah, because because like, it seems like they could get away with charging for those individually and right. have them be a better so, value proposition. Yeah, like I don't know. It's it's really it's a tough really situation, I to think, see. because they have been burned a couple times now with the virtual console service like the wii service started off really strong but i think they saw sales kind of drop off and i think it was also a product of the time and the market of the number of people who bought wii's and never really connected them online or never sought yeah, to, really to go on on the wii shop channel and buy old games like that was something that tapered off and then with wii u you had a much more dedicated audience who would have bought a bunch more games but they were kind of scared off i think by what the wii had done to that system and, and they were much more you know um oh, we're just going to put out one game at a time and not really you know uh flood the system as it were um right so with the switch they have the potential to capture people again i think they have more potential this time because we're in a era in 2017 where the internet is way more ubiquitous than it was with the wii in 2006 a lot more people are connecting their devices and a lot more people know about these digital spaces so the 25 year old who is having a switch wants to play a game boy game maybe that they remember from their youth and if that is popping up a la carte then they are more likely to do so so i think they're in a better position from a market standpoint for the demographic of, of the person who owns a switch to actually invest money in their digital storefront but whether or not they want to go down that route again is up to them. And it, at the moment, it doesn't seem like they're going to. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. And then it just becomes a question of what you're going to get for your subscription model, and like how much are you going to like pay? How much you're going to get for the money you're paying? And... Right. And if it's only twenty dollars a year, it seems like they're not um, they're not bound to give you a bunch of games. Right. How how far is that going to go beyond? I think a lot of people are getting very um, excited that it's going to be this Netflix style library. And I really don't think it's going to be like Netflix in the sense that you'll have this wide variety. I, I do think mm. that it's going to be a few games and they will rotate in and out. You know, like they they will pull stuff at points. But if, if you've had access to it, you still have access to it, right? Because that's the sure. thing that annoyed people was like, oh, I don't want to lose it. Um, like, so Could it be a hybrid of a la carte and subscription model? 
and like and I think that's possible. fairly likely to be honest yeah you know they would I think they'd be silly not to just have the option for a la carte because there's always going to be people who want to do that the question yeah. then becomes are you just getting more people who are just really burned by what you've done in the past like does the a la carte thing then connect back to Wii U and 3DS yeah. and let you get stuff free or for a small fee to pay um, it feels weird if they did go back to Wii U or 3DS that they're leaving it this long to the point where not in the 3DS's case because obviously people they're still promoting the 3DS hugely we've got Metroid right. coming out on 3DS it's, it's sure. mad they're just prolonging that life cycle but if if someone's dusted like their Wii U's getting dusty and then in maybe a year and a half time they're going to be like oh yeah your Wii U you can get all your games from it people would be like yeah that's great but i just sold my wii u like a yeah. year ago <laughs> thanks a lot like I, i'm worried that the, the the time gap legitimizes them not bringing back wii u games to download over to the switch more and more the, the longer that time period gets but who kn- like who knows this isn't intended like it's, it's unpredictable they could do anything yeah they could just release a game boy advance classic that has game boy games on it as well and you know it's just Whatever the hell they want to do, they're going to do. Um, and, you know, business will dictate that a lot of the time. And whether Nintendo have the, the business acumen to do so is, is another question. But they seem to be doing all right right now, you know? Like, people are excited about the Super Nintendo Classic. People are very excited about the Switch. Um, and they, they swear, uh, you know, up and down that there's going to be more stock this time. But if you go by the UK pre-orders, well, they're all gone already. So we'll see about that, Nintendo. And they have already um, said that it's only for a year only, right? Uh, well, yeah, they said uh, up until the end of 2017. So it's launching in September, which is only a couple of months away, actually. Jesus. Uh, and, yeah, and then it's going to be not sold after Christmas. Which... See, this idea that there's sort of like a time limit on how long they're sold, it's like they're... Pre- so they want to protect the a la carte model in a way like they want to they want to say like right we've put those out there for the hardcore fans who got their hands on one fine great but we're not going to just sell them indefinitely in the sense that oh in two three four years time yeah we're going to have our a la carte menu on the switch and you're obviously going to be able to buy them all each individually like maybe that's their way of protecting it it's just like they do these special systems the hardcore fans get it completely divides the internet everyone goes it's like trying to murder people to get their hands on them and then they they just say oh yeah but but th- that was the whole point because we didn't want everyone having full access to all of our library that's why we did that you know uh yeah maybe i i think uh it makes sense when you're talking about if if it was still on the market while they had the uh you know a la carte option available it would be hard to justify the prices they charge on an individual game basis when you have this product yeah. out there that has them as a bundle for a much cheaper price. Right. Um, or a la carte comes and they seriously slash the prices, which is still also a, po- a possibility. Or alternatively, they just say, hey, when we uh, do these games on the uh, eShop, this is the SNES Mini Bundle, and you can pay the same price as the Super Nintendo Mini and get all those games on your Switch which right. would be awesome. Perfect. I, I would probably prefer to do that than buy the Super Nintendo Mini, honestly. Um, but I, I doubt they'll do that because yeah. they're Nintendo. Um, yeah. So. Huh. Good, old, good old bit of armchair CEOing is, is always is always welcome. Look, when you do a Nintendo podcast ballet, that's half of your job <laughs> is yeah, armchair I mean, CEOing. <laughs> exactly. Uh, okay, so uh, before we close out the show, let's uh, quickly uh, touch on Zelda DLC news that just dropped a little bit today, uh, which isn't much, very, very short kind of in-development trailer. Um, and, for uh, pack two. Yes, for the, uh, for the main pack coming at the end of the year, which uh, apparently you'll still be playing as Link, uh, and it will be set after... Uh, the game uh, ended so this is interesting Valley because I don't think anyone predicted this I think everyone was predicting it's going to be in the past and you might be a chance to play as Zelda uh, but you're not going to be able to so <laughs> that's a shame maybe uh, the next Zelda game we can play as Zelda <laughs> uh, yeah you know I hope they heard the feedback you know uh, when we were talking before about the whole Animal Crossing stuff and now with them doing a lot more representation with characters it seems like Nintendo do listen uh, so I think that hopefully that message gets heard. And, uh, I'd go with selective hearing above above yeah, listening, perhaps. Maybe, maybe <laughs> that, that that could be true. Um, 
but yeah i mean i'm excited for this dlc uh i've just beaten breath of the wild uh and i want more like i want to see what this has at the end of the year and like you know the holidays is the holiday is always a great time where you've got a bit of time off there's some pretty hot games coming out at the end of this year and this year i'm gonna be playing mario odyssey and xenoblade chronicles 2 and what throw in a, a bit more Breath of the Wild at the end of the Breath year. Of the like, what more could oh, you want? Man, what a what a lineup! What more really could you want? Oh yeah, that's right, a Metroid game. But hey, that's coming too. Oh my God, what is what is what is 2017? What is going on? It's crazy. Yeah, it's looking good. So, uh, with that, Bally, let's close things out for the show. Um, wrap it up. Uh, where can people find us on the internet? Please find me on Twitter. I'm at Ballyman91. That's B A L L Y M A N 91. Uh, I've also plugged my, my Switch friend code or whatever you call it on my. I've pinned a tweet that includes it. So if you want to friend me on the good old Switch, good old Switch is brand new. You know what I mean. The Switch, uh, that would be great. Uh, also follow the podcast Twitter account, which of course is at TNL Podcast. That's at TNL Podcast. It's the best, best place to go to find out when the podcast comes out like when the most recent episode comes when it comes out on youtube complete with timestamps and all that good stuff so make sure to check that out and if i remember i'll also post a link to me failing in twilight princess uh, on that twitter account so yeah you can have uh, fun times with that uh you can find me at lord nbz on twitter um and yeah, uh, now that the Switch has the photos things, I can, instead of taking a shitty picture with my camera of me, yay, I beat a game, I can just send it straight to Twitter, which I've enjoyed because I just did that with uh, Mighty Gun Vault Burst. Uh, so, so that's cool. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can uh, also find us in various places. We are on iTunes, we are on Stitcher, um, and you can review us on iTunes. That is very helpful, it really helps the show get out to many people as possible if there is one thing you can do if you enjoy the show write us an itunes review better than anything else um We'd but you can it. also send your feedback to us which we really dearly desperately need so please send some emails It'd be really nice uh to our email address which is bally this nintendo life at gmail.com that is this nintendo life at gmail.com please send us your emails and your thoughts and your comments and your criticisms but hey if you've if you've listened all the way to the end of the show at this point i don't think you've got many criticisms can you like i mean if you're not a fan if you're not a fan know, there are a lot of podcasts i listen to and <laughs> get to the end and i'm like well i had a few criticisms there <laughs> so everyone anyway you, you, you must like the, the show a little bit if you've m- managed to hang on this long <laughs> yeah sure yeah that makes sense um, all right. Uh, anything else uh, before we go, Bally, to plug? Uh, it's uh, it's getting hot here in the summertime. I need some Splatoon 2 to cool me down. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. A bathtub of ink. Yeah. Bathtub That'll of cool ink. You right down. Got to bathe. Got to bathe. Uh, that's what we'll be doing. So join us in a couple of weeks' time uh, for another episode of This Nintendo Life, where we shall talk about Nintendo, all the things we love all the things we hate, and and much more. So uh, thanks for joining us, and we'll be back in a couple of weeks. Goodbye, everyone. (laughs) 